You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California. And before we begin, I want to remind you that there's a website that is associated with this podcast. It's wealthformula.com. Lots of free stuff there. Go check it out. Uh, also, it is where you would sign up for our accredited Regulation D investor group to learn about deal flow, et cetera. You must be accredited to join. But if you are accredited, uh, you may want to get off the sidelines, especially after hearing today's podcast interview that we're going to do. So go to wealthformula.com, make sure you check out all the resources, downloads, et cetera, there. And also, uh, if you're a credit investor, sign up for our investor club. Now, as far as today, I want to talk about, uh, well, let's start out with this. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, a lot of concepts on Wealth Formula podcasts related to personal finance. Sometimes it can be overwhelming, especially for newbies in our Wealth Formula Nation. So let me just summarize some of the basics, okay? This is just, you know, Wealth Formula 101. First, and I think this is the most important, make sure you're protecting your family against the economic fallout of an unexpected death, okay? I think it's so important. And you know from my previous interviews and estate planning, uh, that kind of thing. I take this stuff very seriously. And, uh, you know, if, if you want to protect your family, that's what you got to do. Estate planning, uh, including life insurance. It's really critical. Uh, as far as life insurance, uh, you may know I'm a firm advocate of cash value life insurance, such as Wealth Formula Banking. If you don't know what that is, go to wealthformulabanking.com. Uh, in doing so, uh, that provides you the additional uh, element of not only protecting your family, but amplifying the wealth that you have through your investments as well. So it's a really uh, interesting paradigm and concept. Check that out, wealthformulabanking.com. Now, once you protect, you know, your your blind side, so to speak, right? Once you Once you protect your family against the unexpected, then you need to consider asset protection because you don't want to be a lawsuit or creditor away from bankruptcy. Cover your assets, as they say. Get in touch with someone like my attorney, Doug Laudmel, uh, sooner rather than later. You may not need the whole kit and caboodle, right? You may not need the offshore stuff and all that. But make sure that you're not, you know, you're just not a, a, a hitting as somebody riding their bike away from bankruptcy. Now, Finally, the Wealth Formula Ethos Basics 101 is to invest in real assets that not only make you money, but also mitigate your tax burden because it's not just what you make, but it's actually what you keep. And in my humble opinion, the ideal investment for this purpose is to invest in apartment buildings. So I have searched high and low for investments uh, that offer comparable yield with the same risk profile and you know benefit as investing in value add working class apartment buildings in fast growing markets and you know people talk about well you know maybe there's more money in development that kind of thing i i wondered that too so i looked down that route but the reality is that even real estate development really doesn't make any sense to me right now it might in the future you know, the yields are really no better, at least in the apartment building space, than what I'm getting on value at apartment buildings with a fraction of the risk. And those of you who are in an investor club uh, know what I'm talking about. You know, we've also seen the resilience of apartment building investments in the hands of competent operators, pandemics, deep recessions, eviction moratoriums, locusts aside, we have fared quite well. And investors are seeing that firsthand. And now we are out of immediate danger and the economy is growing at an incredible clip. I remember seeing, I think last quarter it was like 6.3% or something. Don't quote me on that, but it was something that was like, whoa, that is really, really significant. 
Why fiscal and monetary policy combined with pent-up demand for goods and services, that's what's creating the economic boom that, in my opinion, will be the second coming of the Roaring Twenties. This is the 2020s. And, and they're going to, we're going to look back and we're going to call this the Roaring Twenties again. You see, I believe we are just at the beginning of one of the best times to make money in decades uh, in the United States. And, and, and I'll tell you what, uh, in an upcoming episode, you're going to hear me talk a lot uh, about why I am so bullish on the United States and why I think it's downright silly to be talking about investing in, you know, other countries and the third world and the Caribbean and all that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But I also believe that people who invest as much money now, now, into real estate uh, as they can. We'll be very, very happy uh, in a few years if those properties are improved and managed competently, which is really, really key. You know, on the contrary, on the other side, sitting on the sideline is pretty much a guaranteed way to lose money. Why? Well, you know what? I talked about the uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Um, That's a lot of printing of money. Along with that real economic growth, we are also going to see some significant inflation that becomes part of that GDP growth. And your money in the bank is therefore guaranteed to lose money. Now, for again, for those people who are new, why am I saying that? Because what is your bank going to give you? Less than 1%. Now, inflation, if it's going at 3%, that means you're guaranteed to lose money if you keep money in the bank, right? So if you want to have liquidity, maybe think about some of these wealth formula banking concepts or whatever. Uh, But man, money in the bank, a lot of money in the bank, more than just your basic stuff right now um, is pretty much a guaranteed loss. And if you want to lose money for sure, then that's what you do. So if you're an accredited investor, uh, you are going to start seeing... um, the result, you're going to start seeing us pick up significantly in terms of our acquisition rate within our investor club. Why? Because of everything I said, it is go time. That is my opinion. It is absolutely go time. And of course, you don't have to take my word for it, just my word for it. I highly recommend not just taking my word for it. But to help you understand why I feel the way I do, I interviewed uh, my friend and um, uh, partner, Dave Steele, who's the co-founder and principal um, of Western Wealth Capital, along with Janet with Page. Dave is, uh, anybody who's met him, he's just an extraordinary guy. He's been in real estate for three decades. I met him ultimately through a connection advocated by Kenny McElroy, who I also have a lot of respect for. And Dave has been an extraordinarily prescient individual when it comes to his forecasts in the economy and real estate. So if you want to know why I think it's go time, make sure to listen to this week's interview with Dave Steele when we come back after these messages. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast, well, he's no stranger to our group, to Wealth Formula in general, or especially to our private investor group, our investor club. He is, of course, Dave Steele. And as you know, Dave is the co-founder and a general partner of Western Wealth Capital. However, his accomplishments go way back before that. He's been one of Canada's top real estate entrepreneurs for 30 years. Accomplishments include being Entrepreneur of the Year one year. I remember, Dave. I know it's not even listed on your bio, but I think that's kind of cool. Uh, he's also led a publicly traded real estate company. He's its CEO and, and has really uh, you know led several major developments across North America. Dave, uh, it's great to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Buck. Always a pleasure. So let's see. Where do we start, man? I mean, geez, this has been a crazy year. Obviously, we had a major event in the pandemic in 2020. You know, we'll talk specifically about Western Wealth Capital in a bit. But, you know, give us a recap of what happened in multifamily, specifically, you know, our niche of of apartment buildings uh, across the country during that time and who maybe were the winners and the losers. 
Well, you know, it's interesting because as I was thinking of this, I thought the very first thing that came about when the pandemic hit, we had a property under contract in Houston. And as a company, we had a million dollar deposit, hard deposit up to buy that property. And we had all the money raised by the investors. Um, And we were so nervous about what the pandemic was going to bring that we gave all the investors back their money and we lost the million dollar deposit to that seller. You know, sort of in hindsight, maybe we should have bought it, but, you know, we just felt we weren't in a position to risk our investors' capital with that much uncertainty. So going into the pandemic and what we thought it was, we were nervous. Um, I guess as we've gone through it, you know, we've been very, very pleasantly surprised by a whole bunch of things. Number one, everything that we've been trying to do with technology in the, in the property management and the operations business just went and got supercharged. People started paying their rent online. Um, they started booking facilities like using the gym and the pool, booking that online. So all these things that we had in the works probably went at the, at a rate of speed that was two or three years faster than how they normally would have unfolded. In the bigger well, picture, though, Dave, how did generally did uh, you know apartment building investors fare during this period? It didn't seem like there was this hemorrhage or blood in the street uh, that, that that I think a lot of people really kind of were worried about. And, and frankly, some investors had been waiting for six or seven years on the sidelines. Uh, it didn't seem to happen. I mean, were, were there many losers? Well, you know, I think in some markets, and we'll say there were places in California where, you know, 85% of the people paid their rent. Right. We didn't see much below 95, 96%. So, you know, most people found that their home was super important to them. And so the last thing that they were going to do was not pay their rent. So, you know, we went through a period where we were obviously very nervous. Are people going to pay their rent? Um, Obviously, people didn't move. They didn't want to. Nobody wanted to be moving from one apartment community to another. So there wasn't a lot of movement. Um, uh, So, you know, it really became how's this new way that you can communicate with tenants? The leasing offices pretty much closed down. So, you know, uh, tours were being done uh, over FaceTime where you would, you know, someone would show up at your apartment complex and you'd talk them through the model suite using FaceTime. So, um, but you're right, at a 50,000 foot level, uh, the only thing that really transpired was the majority of the people paid their rent. And as we got near the end of the pandemic, we started to see quite a few people who had built up pretty good sized bad debt checks with us where, you know, there was some scammers. There were some people that just flat out couldn't pay their rent. Um, and, you know, even that has turned out to be really positive because the government has really come in with this last round of funding and pretty much paid the rent for almost anyone whose rent was in arrears. So the craziest thing was, is that the education process was about how do you tell someone who hasn't paid their rent for six or nine months that's not answering their apartment door. How do you tell them, look, just answer the door and we can take you to an agency. We'll help you fill in the paperwork and that agency will pay your rent for the last year. Right. And some people were so scared or uneducated, I guess, if you will, that they thought the better scenario was just to hide out and then sneak off in the middle of the night and not pay the rent. So fortunately, the majority of the people that we got to talk to, we got them through the agencies and, in the last three or four months, we've collected a huge amount of rent through these different agencies. Um, how do you, how much do you think the specific niche helped Western Wealth Capital? When I talk about the niche, it's not only apartment buildings, but it, it seems to me that the new builds, the the A class stuff, got hit harder than the working class stuff. Do you think that's true? Well, you know, certainly, certainly the demand for renovated units was the highest and even today is the highest it's ever been. And, you know, the rents now for brand new build or call it double what they are for a renovated suite. So, you know, anytime there's a tightening of the belt, people say, wow, I can get this beautiful renovated suite. It's got stainless steel appliances and quartz countertops and it's got hardwood floor. Do I really need to pay double my rent to be in a brand new building? And so, so clearly during the pandemic, the renovated suites were in demand. And now as we're coming out of it, um, you know, there's so many people moving to these various cities now that 
that the demand for renovated is even higher. It's like we're trying to figure out how you ramp up the renovated even more because that demand is just it's just insatiable. So this was an unusual crisis and it was a recession. I mean, the the asset prices, however, strangely enough, didn't substantially take a hit across the board, whether it's, you know, stocks or real estate. And now we're kind of out of that, right? And in fact, I think uh, the last, uh, you know, quarterly GDP report I saw was uh, like 6.3% growth in the U.S. And clearly, so the recession is over. Presumably, there is some inflation out there, too. And again, people were waiting on the sidelines, waiting for prices to crash, but nothing really happened. So given that really, you know, I mean, this has got to be in your, you know, your career, you know, over spanning three decades, a really unusual scenario to have had sort of a low point in the market, you know, low point in the market that really didn't turn out being a big downturn really for asset prices or performance. So where do you think you're headed or we're headed as a real estate market over the next few years, given this sort of, you know, unusual situation where there really wasn't a correction? Well, I, you know, I think the fundamental thesis of our business is that the United States needs four and a half million new apartments over the next decade. 12 years. So they need about 350,000 new apartments a year, right? Mm -hmm. So, and long before the pandemic hit, the U.S. was not producing enough new apartments. So these cities where the people are moving, the Dallas, the Phoenix, the Atlanta, uh, the Las Vegas, these cities where people are moving, they need a lot more new apartments. But going into the pandemic, they were already way behind. So if they're supposed to be building 350,000 a year, they only had construction capacity to build, say, 300,000. So every year, the gap just kept getting bigger and bigger. So now you roll in this pandemic, and all of a sudden, the new construction went way down, right? People mm -hmm. weren't comfortable being on construction sites. Lenders weren't comfortable lending money. So this gap of new construction hasn't gone away. The people haven't stopped moving to these places, but the, the new building hasn't gone away. Yeah. So if you own existing multifamily real estate in the right markets, fasten your seatbelt because we're in for a tremendous period of growth um, and you're in for a tremendous period of rent growth, particularly if you've got the ability to renovate the suites because too many people are moving to the cities. The, the new apartments that should be being built to meet the demand aren't being built. And so the only way to fill that demand is with existing supply, and that just means we all get to charge more rent. All right. So we've got, you know, presumably we're headed for significant rent growth. You know, I get this question a lot, though, and I want to I want to get your feedback on this because I always answer it, and I want to see your perspective on this. Interest rates, you know, can they be lower than they are now? I guess they could be. I mean, you were one of the few people who I think a year ago – uh, before the pandemic was actually saying, hey, look, uh, you know, compared to the rest of the world, we're actually pretty high, right? But these interest rates are obviously a big part of what's driving down um, cap rates. Cap rates continue to compress and people will continue to get nervous. And you've got a lot of people out there who have been, you know, beating the drum for really for years about how these prices can't get higher and these compression, you know, these cap rates are compressed so much. So why shouldn't we be worried about that, Dave? Well, I think we probably should. The question isn't should we? The, the real question is when. Right. I mean, I mm -hmm. think we're going to have a significant period of strong inflation. Um, you know, is that a year, two, three, four? You know, that I don't know how many years. I'm not a. I'm not an economist. Or sort of, even if I was, I wouldn't get it right. So, <laughs> yeah. but there's some there's some period of time where I think we're going to see some real strong inflation. And and yeah, then there's the argument that the governments are going to come in. Um, but again, you know, the the driver in the markets that we're in. The driver in the markets that I would say the Western wealth is in and what I would tell you as an investor that is a good market to go in, the driver is there's not enough new construction going in there. And so as a result, you're going to you, there's a natural increase in the price that has to happen with the older stock 
to, to get up to a price closer to what new construction is. And that means the rents have to move correspondingly. So there's certainly some period of time down the road where we should all be, we should all be a, a little more nervous. Um, but, you know, I think we're very, very early in this stage of growth, of value growth and of rent growth. Um, and I think you're right. Somewhere down the road, we should all be we should all have some nervousness around interest rates going higher. So, so let me ask you this though: What would you have to see significantly, I guess, to potentially alter that business model, or even stop buying apartment buildings? I mean, do you do, have you thought about this? I mean, what 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 types of things would you, would be red flags? Well, you know, I'll give you an example, Buck. We're, we're I've been in the real estate market in Canada for 30 years. So in Canada and in a lot of the larger cities in the U.S., there is no more ability to buy older product and renovate it and fix it up on any scale. Almost every major community has been acquired and has been renovated and has been brought up to brought up to standard that would be a rental standard, right? Now, the uniqueness in the markets that we're in in the U.S., is that there is still quite a lot of product that, that, as you know, we call classic product, right? You walk inside, it's got the turquoise toilet and the shag carpeting, and you go, wow, it's got the orange, it's got the orange and yellow fridge and stove. And you look at it, you go, wow, somebody needs to renovate this. So, so you know, the, the point I believe where you will say, hey, there, there's no more real room to do this is the day that there's that there's no more of that product to really buy and renovate. So, right. um, and you know, in the markets we're in, the good news is there still is a fair amount of that product that to buy. It's certainly not as available as it was three years ago, but it's certainly not anywhere near the point it is in in more mature cities. And and when it gets to that point in more mature cities, the business model typically shifts, and what people go into is they go into building brand new rental units. Because the only way to then fill that demand, hey, there's still lots of people moving here. How do we fill the demand? The only real way to fill the demand is to build brand new. Let's talk a little bit. Um, you know, obviously, we've been sort of assuming up to this point that everybody already knows everything about Western Wealth Capital and all that, just because the, you know, we've we've been, we've we've talked together many times. Many people are in the our private investor groups and stuff like that. But let's let's talk specifically about Western Wealth Capital. Tell us about the business and what you've been able to accomplish. What what makes you different? All that. Well, okay. Um, so seven years ago, I partnered up with Janet LePage. Um, again, many of the people on with the Wealth Formula have met Janet. Janet's a computer scientist, uh, incredibly bright, analytical, uh, and there's nothing in our business that Janet doesn't put into a model and run through an Excel model to determine. Uh, you know, how it works in the model. So, um, so, you know, she came to me and said, she'd been buying and flipping single family homes seven years ago down in Phoenix. She said, Dave, there's an opportunity to buy, to buy apartment buildings. Um, She walked me through the model. I said, wow, this is, this is amazing. I didn't actually even believe that the model was available because we'd been doing it in Phoenix 10 years earlier. Um, and uh, we did we did our first couple deals, uh, and since then we've done ninety two properties. We've acquired, along with you know many many wealth formula investors, uh, almost three billion dollars worth of real estate. Um, and you know collectively our investor group has raised almost eight hundred million dollars, which again sounds like a big number, but that's with a lot of people putting twenty five and fifty thousand dollars into each property. Some people putting two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in each property. But it's it's really sort of tailored so that each individual investor can invest at a comfort level that, that they want in each property. Um, so you know we went out, we started this formula. We've sold thirty of the deals where we've gone through what we call our full cycle. So we buy them, we fix them up, we renovate them, we move the rents to market, we renovate the suites, we put in washer dryers, we fix up the pool, we redo all the common areas and the leasing, we paint the buildings. And of the 30 deals that we've sold, we've held for an average of about 30 months. And those 30 deals that we've sold, the investors have had an average annual return of 30%. So um, obviously the investor base is very, very happy. The returns have been phenomenal. Um, And then partway through this process, the lenders changed their program where 
they would allow us to refinance as we increase the value of these buildings. And as we refinance the buildings, the investors could pull their equity out through a refinance. Um, so, um, you know, we've really refined the system. Our whole business, as you know, is about speed. The faster we can renovate the suites, the faster we can get the appraisals at a higher price, the faster we can refinance, the faster we can give the investors back their money, and they can do it over and over again. So, you know, we have many investors that have taken that fifty or a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, and they've recycled it now with us several times through the process. Um, so, you know, it's a complete formula. It's repeatable. It's scalable. Uh, it works because it's a formula. And, um, you know, we go in and we look for a very specific type of building that, that meets our criteria. And when I say our criteria, as you know, Buck, the criteria meets is it goes through Janet's mm. model right. and it literally becomes a black and white decision. If it doesn't work in the model, we just simply don't buy it. So we don't move very much on what we project in terms of rent growth. You know, we're going to, I think we're going to see markets this year that, well, Atlanta is an example. We're going to see Atlanta go up 10% year over year at rent growth. Yet in our model, we put in a 4%, 4.5% rent growth. So, so we don't, we don't take the year or two or three where we're seeing these phenomenal numbers. We sort of build a very formula, formula based um, and, you know, it's the formula works and uh, it's generated just spectacular returns. So so it's, it's a value add model and basically working class apartment buildings. We're not talking about, you know, D class. We're not talking about the A stuff. We're talking about working class stuff. Do you think, you know, what I tell people when they ask what what the main difference between Western Wealth Capital uh, and other value adds, um, I have tended to say the the focus on the, on, on speed and processes. Uh, do you, do you think that that's really the main uh, difference between you uh, between Western Wealth Capital and other uh, you know operators? No question. And you know, as you know, you, you know, you've been on a, several of the tours that we've done where we've had you know fifty, seventy five, a hundred. Uh, potential investors and clients come on the trips to Dallas and to Phoenix. And, you know, we do a day long bus tour where we take people and we show them the building we're about to buy a building we closed on six months ago, a building we closed on a year ago and people get off the bus at the end and they go, Dave, we just, we can't believe what this building, what it was and what you turned it into. It's, it's almost like watching one of those home decorating TV shows where you can't believe yeah. at the end that, that it is. And again, you know, we, we have an iPad app that we're just finishing right now for our wow factor. And when our acquisition team walks through a building, we only paint a building one of three color schemes. We only put a signage package of one of three signage packages. When we choose what color we're painting the building, we match the, the pool furniture to the color of the building. We match the barbecue set. Janet was just in Phoenix a couple of weeks ago and she came back and she goes, Dave, we've got this new lighting that goes around the palm trees. And they spent a half an hour on the, on the property deciding should the lighting that goes up the palm tree go up a third of the height of the tree or a half of the height of the tree? Because once we do it, it's fully standardized. We don't do it one way on one property and another way on another property. So again, it just allows this this repeatability because you're spending all your time executing and not all your time designing. And so, you know, when we renovate a suite, when we go into that suite in Atlanta, we use the same flooring, the same lighting, the same plumbing fixtures, the same countertops as we do in, as we do in Phoenix, as we do in Dallas, as we do in Houston. So when you go through a property, there's a full standardization. And, and so all of those things what they really mean is we're not thinking through every time we do a property what we're going to renovate, what it's going to look like. It's already pre-designed, and that's where you really get the speed. Because in simple terms, every time I get a $150 rent increase, I'm getting between a thirty and a $35,000 increase in the value of the property. So if I can do five a month at $30,000, my property goes up by hundred and fifty grand a month. If I can do 10 a month, then my property goes up by $300,000. So the math is very, very simple. How do I build the model to get to 10 a month on my renovations so that as a tenant moves out, I renovate it and I, and I get that rent bump 
which translates into the value increase. And so one thing a lot of investors like is that every every month we put the financial statements up on their portal so they can go and look and see each financial statement on each property. And people come back and they go, Dave, I can't believe it. The rents have moved so rapidly in the mm-hmm. 90 days since you took over the property. And it's because we're just going through the same streamlined process on every property. Yeah. And I think that's a really, uh, that's, a, that was a real eye, eye opener for me too, because I think, you know, as, as real estate investors who are used to looking at pro formas, you know, you always got your, uh, three year, your five years, uh, and you never really think about this whole concept that, yeah, but what if you could do all these things they're saying on this pro forma in half the time, <laughs> right? Then, then, then you're doubling returns, and that's effectively kind of the been the secret sauce, right? I mean, it's been able to you know execute um, and do good work. Like there's other good operators out there, but to do it profoundly fast, and that's not just because you want to get it done. Of course, you want to get it done, but that affects returns and it seems so basic but it is but it's uh, it's something that I don't think a lot of of operators actually uh think of much um you know, and, you know it's yeah. really interesting but because if you think about it most people that own real estate own it and they have a full-time job and off the side of their desk they're renovating a suite and they don't really think well I have six a six unit building boy if I could renovate them all in the first month what would happen to the value of the building they just sort of renovate them as they go we have a completely different view of the world because we're making widgets and our widget is take a classic unit that looks like it was occupied in 1994, which it is now go in, renovate that suite, get $150 for the rent, get $50 if you can get them to take a washer dryer and the washer dryer, we simply put a flyer underneath the door that offers everybody the option to have a washer dryer put in their unit. And if they say yes, the following Tuesday, we deliver them a washer dryer to their unit and they start paying $50 more per month. And you'd say, well, Dave, you're not going to get rich at $50. Well, you sure are because every washer dryer that goes in, the value of that property goes up by 10 grand, right? So if you paid $150,000 per unit and you put 20% down, that's 30 grand, you made 33% on your money just simply by putting in a washer dryer. Mm-hmm. So if we can do gold star renovations, washer dryers, move the rents to market. We put in pet yards. We get $125 for a ground floor pet yard in front of your ground floor unit. Um, We put in parcel post. You pay $9 more a month. So all of a sudden we've created like like an order book of a dozen of these things that the second we take over the property, our our on-site teams just go to town and just start knocking off all these items one by one. And then we just track it every single day. So as you know, because I send them to you, you know, we get daily activity reports on every single property. So I'm sitting there watching properties that, you know, the rents were $1,100. That tenant moved out. I renovated the suite, put in a washer dryer. They took a dog yard. They took parcel post. And they're moving back in, the new tenants moving back in at $400 more than what the old tenant moved out at. So for us, that $400 translates to a value increase of around 80 grand for that single property. And so now the question is, how many of those can you do a month? I actually saw one uh, example. I won't name any specifics here, but uh, essentially using that math, it, 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 it created a value increase in the building by a million bucks in a single day, which is pretty remarkable. It, it was, and I'm like, I've been in this business 30 years. We've never, we, that circulated around and we were just all in awe. Yeah. And you know, the thing is everyone's, as soon as we send it out, people say, well, what's that done to my property? So, you know, again, we're trying to get a reporting yeah. system that will show people, but, but this isn't unique to any one building, any one right. place. This is, right. this is literally just how do you turn the wheel? Because if you think about it, so when, when we started, we had a 30 point checklist and over time it grew to a 50 point checklist. And now it's just recently been redone and it's an 82 point checklist. And the goal isn't just to get the 82 points complete. It's to get a significant percentage of them complete by the day we take over the building. So in the 60 day due diligence period, we're ordering the pool furniture. We've got the design teams in there redoing the leasing office and the clubhouse. 
we've lined up the quotes so the painter starts painting the building we take it over because the magic is if you can do all of that on the day you take over that just means it's sooner that you can start charging higher rents because the people don't mind paying more rent what they don't like is they don't like being charged more rent on the basis that you're going to promise them you'll do the work go do the work on the building People drive up, they go, wow, this is this is a deal. This is a great place. This is where I want to live. And they'll pay the rent. You know, it, you know what's interesting is it, it just goes back to something else that I think it's really important to remember is that in this kind of business, it's really all math, right? And having Janet as a computer scientist and these Excel sheets and stuff, it, it really, that's, you know, that's uh, being able to make the math work is is been a a big part of the success part of that math also involves um you know deciding what cities to move into and that sort of thing how do you make decisions on that well again so the the real driving thesis to that is that we look to see the cities that are affordable where the companies are moving their offices to because of the affordability right so you know if you if you look if you look at North Texas, in 2020, 18% of all the industrial space that was acquired in North Texas was acquired by Amazon. 18%, right? So what, is, what does Amazon know that we don't know? They know that they can't afford to hire people in California because it's too expensive. So they've got to find an affordable place. So you just go and rank the cities that are affordable and then go and look, where's Amazon, Apple, Google, Intel, where are all these companies going to? And you'll find Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, San Antonio, Phoenix, Vegas. You'll find those are really the driving cities. There's about seven or eight cities that we've targeted. And that's, that thesis has you know, really yeah. been the thesis that, you know, the fact that there's not enough new construction and the fact that people are moving to affordable markets has really driven the model. And then then you go in and you buy the properties. And again, most people buy real estate because they say, I'm going to pick a market. And I think it's going to be good. I think Phoenix is going to be good. And they go buy a building, but they don't force any appreciation or get any right. more other than, wow, Phoenix is going to be good. If all we did was go buy Phoenix, we would have all had fantastic returns. But we bought Phoenix and we bought Dallas because they're great markets and we can force appreciation on the buildings. Right. So so that's really that's really what drives those markets. You know, in and in, in going back to Phoenix, you know, I remember talking um to Tim McCleary about this a little bit. Um, you know, there was a few years back some reluctance about, you know, people, investors going into Phoenix and and in in some ways, it's the same kind of reluctance that I sensed with some investors uh, about the Las Vegas market. But again, the background here is it's math, right? I mean, it's math. You're looking at the numbers. You're not saying, "Gee whiz," you know. I think it'd be cool to be in Vegas, <laughs> right? These are everything that's done is based on the numbers. Well, and two, two things as well, Mark. One, you're not going to get in much trouble at the purchase price that we're buying buildings at and the price they're currently rented today. So you're not, it's not like you're going to get in a lot of trouble. It's not like you're going to San Francisco and buying a $500,000 unit that rents for you know $3,000 a month, right? That where right. the math just doesn't quite work. So, so they're, they're more affordable units. And the, and the second part that, that is phenomenal for us is we live in a world where we have huge insider information. We own, own and have owned 92 buildings in all these markets. So when someone says, hey, the building up the street is for sale, here's what their rent roll is. We look at six or seven buildings that surround that building that we own or have owned, and we go, what are the rents we're getting in those today? Oh, my God, that guy's only getting $900 on a renovated unit. We're getting $1,350. Boom. We know just go renovate those units and that model works like crazy, right? So, you know, I tell people that if, you know, if we were in the stock market, we'd, we'd all be in jail for trading on insider information. But right. fortunately, real estate's a market where that's that's a huge advantage to right. owning owning the data, right? We have the data. So every virtually every neighborhood we're in, we're just looking and going, 
you know, somebody's missing the boat here. So big part of the key for us is how do we find these deals that are off market? Um, because a lot of the good deals are somebody's owned it for a long time. The market's going up. They're sitting on their hands. They're missing the fact that these markets are experiencing great rent growth or they see a rent growth, but they, they don't want to move their tenants out because they've been in there for a long period of time. They don't want to spend any money fixing up the building. So it creates a good opportunity for, for both those things to happen. So I know um, that you and Janet and really, I mean, you got the whole team there uh, involving your own family and friends and all that as, as investors. So what advice right now, given where we are in the markets, given where Western Wealth Capital and what they're doing, what advice do you give your friends and family about investing in real estate right now? Cool. It's good. I mean, the right now is the important part to that question. I mean, you know, there certainly are places where, you know, in single family homes and in buying a house where the market is, you know, really, really heated. Um, you know, again, I would, I would say, follow the math. And I would say, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to invest in real estate, understand the model and the math. And if you, if you don't, buy into the underlying assumptions, don't invest. But the real basis today is that, you know, the next several years in my mind in multifamily, we are going to see, we are going to see a period of time where we get to make up for the last 18 months where, uh, you know, where it was, you know, we rode through, we rode through a tough time. But we were, I tell people we were, we were one of those very lucky businesses through a tough time. You know, owning apartments and investing in Amazon, those are two great places you could have put put your money to get through this. But I think the dividends are going to pay for the next several years because there's just this, there's just, there's just this pent up demand. So, you know, all my friends are like, wow, Dave, you guys have made great money in these. Should I put some money in? And of course, you're always more reluctant, you know, to, to, temper, temper your friends' expectations as well. Right. So, you know, what I tell them is number one, don't take my word for it. Go and do the math and do the analysis. Do you believe that there's going to be a shortage of product of new apartments in the U S if you do, then the simplest part of this business exists. And that's going to be that there's more demand than there is supply. So that's a good thing. Number two, do you believe the thesis that these big companies are moving to these cities? Because That's where you're going to get the tailwind of growth. That's why Vegas is projected to grow at 6.3% a year for rent growth for each year for the next three years. So so if you believe that, then getting involved in a piece of real estate where you have that tailwind. And then number, number three is really understand how the math works to get the return. And as you said, in the value add model, there's just a huge ability to force that appreciation. So, so to me, it's very methodical. It isn't, you can take a lot of the emotion out of it. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm always reluctant. People say, Dave, you should put your money into this. This is the greatest thing in the world. And we've all seen those deals, but you know, at the end of the day, I always go to, what are the base assumptions? Do I believe in the base assumptions? And do I believe they exist today? They'll exist in a year. They'll exist in two or three years. And if I do, then I invest in them. But and, and that's the beauty of real estate is that I think you can very thoughtfully go through and look at look at the, the program and say, this is the way to do it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything you're saying. And I just think, you know, and I've been thinking to myself and I've said it to other people right now, um, you know, being involved in this working class apartment buildings in high growth markets, value add real estate, I can't think of anything that's a, has a better risk profile, a benefit risk profile, right? I mean, you you see, I see, um, you know, shiny objects out there all the time and showing pro formas and all that, but the returns aren't really any better. Usually they're not, and there's so much more risk. So agree 100%. Obviously, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've been uh, an advocate for real estate for a very long time as well, so there's no surprise there. Dave, I want to thank you again for being on Wealth Formula Podcast again, and it's always great to hear from you. And uh, I'm sure, in you know, our group is going to be super excited. To hopefully, the next time we have a live event, it's always a great treat to have you there. Thank you very much. Looking, we're all looking forward to that. 
a little a little wine where we don't have to share <laughs> it across a computer screen. There you go. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hopefully you get it now. I ho hopefully you understand why I am so bullish I and mean, why Dave is so bullish. Uh, we are, again, I believe we're at the uh, precipice of the roaring 20s. And those who invest now as much as they can into competent hands managing real estate, I think are going to fare very well. I certainly am going to do the same thing. I bought a lot of real estate myself this year. And so hopefully uh, you will take these opinions under consideration. Obviously, it's just an opinion. I'm not a financial advisor, and financial advisors uh, may give you and probably will give you different information because they have assets under management and that kind of thing. But the case I think we're making is pretty clear. The Roaring Twenties are here. It's go time. If you're an accredited investor, you want to join us on what we're doing, go to wealthformula.com and sign up for our investor club. That's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.